Wassalatu wassalamu ala Rasulullah. So always we start in the name of Allah and we ask that He send His peace and blessings upon our Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Welcome back to another episode of Back to Basics. I am your host, Abd al-Azim Saeed. And we have with us back in the studio today our special guest, Dr. Mamdouh Muhammad. Dr. Mamdouh, welcome honor. back. Jazakumullah khairan. For those of you who don't know, Dr. Mamdouh is a former professor at Johns Hopkins University. He has also worked in several universities across the globe. He is currently the director for Arrow for consultancy and training. And he has traveled abroad as far east as Indonesia and as far west as the United States of America, delivering lectures in topics ranging from education to dawah. Dr. Mamdouh, welcome back to the show. Um, in previous episodes, we've discussed several topics related to education, cultivation, training, uh, teacher improvement. Not cultivation. We didn't talk about cultivation. We talked briefly about cultivation. About cultivating uh, cultivating concepts. children. Cultivating yeah. children. Disciplining. Disciplining is included I'm just in that. Kidding, right? <laughs> okay. Um, I'd like to discuss one issue that uh, some individuals or some teachers specifically have an issue with is where they have certain objectives that they want to accomplish with their students and we mentioned before in previous episode about differentiating between students and taking each student at their own level sometimes administrators or administrations force upon teachers a certain criterion for the exam that can't necessarily fall within those objectives so would you say that evaluation and objectives go hand in hand they have to work together in order for it to be successful yeah I think I do say that. If you make some changes here, you need to make another change in the other hand. Uh, let me give some examples. First of all, when you are about to do any task, you have to have an objective. And Islam is very, very clear about this. Mm -hmm. In everything that you do in this life, your objective would be that you are doing this to reach, to help you access uh, paradise. Yes. So this would be the main objective that you have. Okay. Or your main vision. So in anything that we do in our life, we have an objective. Yes. Right? I'm building a house. My objective is that to build a house in a specific time. My objective is to build a house with this, these specifications to meet the needs of the people who are going to live in it. Yeah. So these are objectives. Everybody, before he or she does anything, he should have objectives. Mm -hmm. Objectives, from time to time, I have to measure the amount of success in reaching these objectives. I put an objective traveling as simple as this. Mm -hmm. Traveling tomorrow to uh, make Umrah. Okay. I have six or seven steps. Each step should lead to the other and the final one uh, should take me to the goal. To make Umrah to, to yeah. Mecca. Mm -hmm. So when I do the first one I would say that I have to specify a certain time for it. Right? And I has I have to specify the action that need to be done. Who is going to do what? Okay. My son is going to uh, arrange uh, the uh, uh, suitcase for me. I have to make few phone calls to make people wait for me in the airport. Mm -hmm. So these are some steps. That this is some sort of planning to help me reach this objective. Yes. During the process or at the end, I have to evaluate that. Mm -hmm. Did I do right? Or did I make mistakes in some of these steps? Okay. So evaluation. If I apply this to education, I have some objectives as the teacher, and that's why smart teachers in mm -hmm. the beginning write these objectives. Mm -hmm. They call them outcomes, and sometimes we call them learning objectives. These are my objectives when I learn this lesson. Yes. These are my objectives as a teacher to teach them to the student. By the end of the lesson, the students would be able to do this and this and this and this. Yes. Very clear. Mm -hmm. At the end of the lesson, I do what? I do evaluation. I evaluate, I put questions mm -hmm. that help me measure how successful I was in achieving the objectives. Okay. Now the objectives well, you we're mentioned done. Just to interrupt, sorry. Yes, please. You mentioned you evaluate at the end of the lesson. Yes. Uh, is evaluation, are you, is that the equivalent to an exam or a quiz or something? Yes. Okay. Evaluation can... Take different forms, yes. Uh, there, 
they are called exams, some, and they are called quizzes sometimes. In any way to evaluate whether you've done mm -hmm. it or not, and how much... Uh, success how successful you've been. Yeah, how successful you are uh, mm -hmm. in doing that. When I do this evaluation, it tells me I did it right, mm -hmm. or I didn't do it right, so or I did it halfway. You, you touched on the key point that I made when you do this evaluation. So what happens when you're the one creating the objectives, you have a goal for your students based on their needs, based on yeah. their abilities, yeah. and the school is saying, no, this is the exam that has to be done. This is the evaluation that has to be done. Uh, this, this, I think, in, in di dictator countries, in countries where there are a lot of dictatorship, this now is no longer valid. Okay. I am the one who uh, is teaching the students. Mm -hmm. I am the one who put the objectives. I am the one who is evaluating this. I can make the school make the evaluation. Okay. I can even make the students do the evaluation. Okay. The most important thing is for me is to help me decide whether I was successful or not. Okay. Now, if I do this, if I find myself not successful, so there's something wrong, either mm -hmm. in the evaluation form or yeah. the evaluation process. Or the objectives were too Or are in the demanding. objectives. Yeah. The obli objectives are too many to be achieved in such a small, uh, short time. Mm -hmm. So that means that next time, that's why it's an ongoing process. So you, the teacher as well is learning from this evaluation. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. absolutely. This is how teachers improve. Mm -hmm. And you would be lucky if you find students who can evaluate you. Mm -hmm. yeah. And if you find all students... Well, they have this for universities, I believe. A lot of universities, universities... And even school. Yeah. If you find that all students fail to answer, the, uh, to achieve the objectives, that means there's something wrong. Something Either wrong with, with the exam. objectives, mm -hmm. they're probably the too hard, or in the methodology that you use to teach the students, right? Or you taught or them in a certain way, and the, the evaluation was not worded in a way in that the they Or in the form could get, of yeah. evaluation. It should be oral evaluation, huh? and you did it written <laughs> evaluation. Yeah. It should be practical evaluation. It's a very interesting subject. Mm -hmm. And something you do this, as simple as this, you are making, you're having a recipe mm -hmm. to make a cake or something like this at home, you or your wife, yeah. right? And you find that it is not up to the level that you expected it to be this. Yeah. Put the objectives, you put the test, so there's something wrong. Mm -hmm. Perhaps the oven was too hot, <laughs> yes, to bake the cake in, in a very slow way. Or perhaps some of the perhaps ingredients were not absolutely. right. Absolutely. Yeah. That's why we learn. Mm -hmm. And you do it, and you, you redo it, and you get feedback, and you do it until you adjust it to exactly this is about right. Mm -hmm. This is the right thing. That and that's how recipes are developed. Nobody, absolutely. Nobody had a recipe book. Teaching methods time. are recipes. Yeah. And this way, you can change here and there. And once again, like recipes, there's no exact right or wrong. No, exactly. What works for some Absolutely. person might not. And what yeah. is good for your taste is not good for my taste. Right. I need a little bit more, more sugar. More salt or more or sugar. Or a yeah. little bit less sugar, and so on and so forth. Yeah. So this is that's why they go hand in hand, mm. and they are ongoing process that there will never be a time that I put objectives, and when I evaluate the, them all the time, unless I am a perfect person, mm -hmm. which is almost impossible for... I would argue that it is impossible. Yeah, why <laughs> not perfect? Why? Because there's a lot of variables. Mm -hmm. Students change from one class into another, right? Mm -hmm. And the curricula that uh, we use is different from one class into another. Mm -hmm. And uh, the teaching methods and the teaching strategies and the techniques are different, right, from one person into another. Yeah. All these factors makes it almost impossible to be the same. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And uh, going on on that, so then it's the responsibility of the teachers to evaluate. Um, but what if there's, for example, in some uh, non-English native countries, there's what's known as American schools or international schools. And so what happens with some of these schools is that they're required to keep up to the curriculum that's taught in America, yeah. which is not always naturally, uh, Doesn't which fit the students are not well. naturally fit, especially mm -hmm. when it comes to things like history and stuff like that, that doesn't Absolutely. fit their own history. History and geography. And geography, yeah. yeah. So how is the school supposed to cope with that in, yeah, in meeting yeah. the objectives of the students? Yeah, this relates to an issue of uh, known as enriching the curriculum. Yeah. If this school adopts the American curriculum, for example, we advise them to take out the classes that are very relevant to Islamic, uh, to American history, mm -hmm. and to add some lessons that belongs to this particular country. Mm -hmm. If this curricula is taught in, uh, for example, in the Middle East, mm -hmm. 
in some Gulf countries, they would replace these portions by six. Aren't, aren't they required to have those portions for the final uh, no, uh, English now, exams? Now, now even the uh, people who are in charge of the American uh, curriculum, they are very flexible mm -hmm. to allow for some change in 30% or something like, to make sense for the people. For the context of the people who are studying. Yeah, the yeah. context of people. Uh, and the same thing applies to geography. Mm -hmm. uh, in general, the social studies issues in an area right that 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 this is changeable that requires a lot yeah, it's of not like it's not like math where it's one it's fixed not like answer math when across the, math the board is there, yeah. Is there. math doesn't yeah. change from even country even to country. the math i would take the math the rule and i can use some examples from my context mm -hmm. i'm measuring the, co the, the the distance between oh yeah that's a given yeah. yeah if you're if you're talking about a textbook and they're saying for example, if they're talking about a country that's never heard of, let's say, trains, just yeah. as an ex yeah. a very abstract yeah, example, you're, right. you're not going to say if a train's traveling at this distance. No, you're going to give an example relative to the country. Yeah, if a train travels from Texas to Arizona, yeah. right, now I'm going to change it. If a tra the train, train travels, travels, travels to from Medina, Turkey yeah. to Medina. Yeah. So now, and that's what sometimes they call it adapting. Yeah, it's not changing mm. the actual you foundations know, changing, of the study. Yeah. It's just changing. Yeah, this would be a wonderful job. That's what we expect from good schools, mm -hmm. to make the enrichment of uh, the curriculum, to make it more relevant to the students. Because people learn things that are relevant to them mm -hmm. more than the things that are irrelevant to them. Okay, let me ask one question. It's known that in many European countries, for example, if you go to Germany, if you go to France, much of what they study is studied in their own native tongue. And it's even if its source is something other than French or German or what have you. So what they do a lot of times is that the scholars of their countries translate these works so that their people can benefit from it in their own language. Oh, yeah. And this was done in the past as well, when, yeah. when in, the, in the peak of, of, of Muslim civilization in uh, Spain, in Islamic Spain, a lot of works that were coming out of ancient Europe and, and ancient Asia and so on were being translated into the Arabic language. They were being reinterpreted, they were being re-understood and re-explained, and then a lot of these Arabic works as a result, became translated back into English, back into uh, Greek, and so yes. on, and exported back to the Western world. Why is it that we find that in many Middle Eastern countries, uh, people have seemed to abandon the idea of translating knowledge and having people understand it in their own native tongue, and instead you find many people uh, learning the English language so that they can access these, these branches of knowledge? Why is it that European countries can manage that, but Middle Eastern countries cannot? I, th I think that uh, the European countries have understood the issue of the essence of maintaining the identity of the country. Exactly. Is to maintain their language. Mm -hmm. And the more you study this language in all subjects, the more it becomes part of you, integral part of you. You cannot take it out easily. Yeah. Uh, and the thing, I think that the people in the Middle East, uh, they are about to do this. Some countries in the Gulf area mm -hmm. have started doing that. Some others have not started yet, mm -hmm. but it is very essential to maintain their tongue in all other subjects. Well, I think this, without getting too political about it, I think it also has to do with the issue of colonization. And some Middle Eastern countries were colonized by Britain, they were colonized yeah. by France, and so they've adopted these, these identities into their culture because yeah. of that. Whereas, uh, yeah. And this is the ecology of some people who had been colonized and who had been uh, defeated by other cultures. Yeah. Yes, they are still too weak to resist. But some of them has already overcome this problem, and they started doing good translation. Mm -hmm. For example, Syria was one of the countries, the only Arab countries, that used to teach medicine mm -hmm. in Arabic. All of it, all aspects of medicine. Mm -hmm. uh, some other countries, I think Iraq, mm -hmm. at a certain point, they were, uh, were on the road. I don't know where they are right now, mm -hmm. but uh, some countries are giving it some trials. And the Gulf area now, they are doing a good job uh, in some schools. Uh, so I see it in the Gulf area, isn't there a majority of students that are now on scholarship programs in the States and in Canada and in Europe? Uh, it's no problem. As long as they have the basic thing, they, they maintain their culture. Yeah. Uh, they had enough study about their culture 
when they were in the in the in the high school and the middle school mm -hmm. elementary school so now they have two cultures which is something very positive yeah. but the first thing the most important thing is that to be the culture number one is your own native culture to preserve the own you tradition perfect, especially yes. considering that uh, most Muslim countries their tradition does go back to the influence of Islam on their cultures yes. and so that's a very positive thing You're for them right. to hold on to the cultural aspects that come from Islam that's their identity right and there's uh, a saying that says, if you want to defeat a people or if you want to rule a people, just rob them of their history. If you take away the history of these countries, then what are they left with? Yes, in any, any, any people in any, any people, country. Any people, if you any take country. The history, yes, I'm not uh, talking about any specific. They are left alone. They are isolated. They're very easy to, for them to fall down. Anyway, let's get back to the topic, inshallah, but we're going to have to go right to a break. So, jazakallah khairan. Barakallah feekum. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome back to the show, Back to Basics, with our guest, Dr. Mamdouh Muhammad. Dr. Mamdouh, just before the break, we were touching briefly on the issue of identity in the Muslim world and how many non-Muslim countries seem to have preserved their identity even when it comes to the issue of education and learning from things that are not necessarily uh, developed in their own country. So what they do is they translate them into their own native tongues and then study it at that point in their own native language in a means to preserve their culture and their identity. How can Muslim countries help to overcome this and this mentality of almost feeling like the English language is superior to the Arabic language or other languages that are predominant in the Muslim country? Now the issue of, I, I, I doubt that people may feel that this is more superior, but because it is more commonly used, mm -hmm. so people like, don't forget that uh, people like to communicate mm -hmm. with each other. We cannot communicate with all these different languages. Mm -hmm. So there should be a few languages that we can communicate through. One of the most common languages now to communicate through is English. Yes. I was reading a, a book three years ago. Uh, it was called The King of Languages. Okay. And I had a big smile on my face <laughs> because I was expecting it to talk about Arabic. Okay. Uh, or at least the queen of languages. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so I was very happy. Uh, and then when I read it, I found the whole book is about uh, English, mm. which is the king of languages nowadays. It is the most common language. It's the most language, commonly yeah. used languages. There should be a language that people should communicate through. Mm -hmm. But which language is it? I think if any nation did the job of uh, uh, England and America and other countries, other speaking countries, to serve the language, to make it very popular, to make it very common, mm -hmm. to make it everywhere, they would have reached the same level of English. Yes. But they were lazy, they were re <laughs> reluctant, and I think still the opportunity is very open for Arabic to yeah. play at least a second role. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a big need for people for Arabic. Uh, one reason, of course, is the Islamic countries. Mm -hmm. The understanding the Quran is, is, understanding. is more than 1.6 mm -hmm. billion, which is golden opportunity for. But before that, uh, the Arabs need to fix the problems that they had, the problems of Amiya, mm -hmm. because... Amiya, you mean colloquial, you mean dialects. Colloquial, yes. I mean the dialect. They need to fix the dialects before they, teach, they fix the... the Arabic. Yeah. Of course, it should be the standard Arabic. Yeah. We'll call it in a better way, modern standard Arabic. Modern standard We Arabic, call yes. it al Arabi al Fusha yes. or al Fasiha now. So we, we, we need to work on this in order to. Once we reach a good level of that, uh, we can aspire for spreading Arabic across the globe. Well, I think there are some trials, some institutes, some schools, some individuals are interested in this in the last 40 years which was something that was not available before that, mm -hmm. which is a positive trend. Uh, recently, you can uh, observe it and the impact on it. There is a school in Indonesia by Imam Muhammad ibn Saud, Islamic University. Mm -hmm. There are some uh, efforts in the USA by individuals. Mm -hmm. there, the quality of the books is, has just started to improve to follow the new methods of uh, no. teaching a language. But what I was arguing, uh, I wasn't arguing that there's no positive uh, objective in learning the English language. Certainly it's a very common language and it can be learned with the intention alone 
to communicate with other people, Absolutely. even for the issue of da'wah and you inviting to people to Islam. Of course. What, my, what I was arguing is that in some uh, Arab nations specifically, you find that many of the signs and many of the uh, even city entrances specifically and exclusively in the English language, which seems very at odds with the reality of, of the honor and the love that Muslims should have for their heritage and for their culture. You wouldn't go to the States and find the entrance to Arizona, for example, written in Arabic. So why is it that when you go to certain Arab cities, you find the entrance to their cities written in English? When people need you, they will write it in Arabic. <laughs> so is there a need for people in Texas or Arizona to use Arabic? Mm. Maybe there's some time that when they find great scholars, great doctors, great engineers, great educators who speak Arabic are living there, they may have an impact. I think about it's all about education. But regardless of this, you find some people now found a lot of interest in the Arabic language because of its unique qualities. Mm -hmm. uh, particularly the people who convert to Islam mm -hmm. or who revert to Islam, mm -hmm. uh, it becomes essential for them to know Arabic mm -hmm. in order to communicate well with the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and with the hadith of the Prophet Muhammad so, Allah Allah Allah. so there is a new trend but from a different angle. I would argue that some scholars of the past made the argument that understanding the Quran and the Sunnah is an obligation on every Muslim it is? and there's no true way to understand these two sources Unless of revelation except in its original Arabic. Yes. So I would argue that many Muslim nations, especially non-Arab nations, and even Arab nations who, like you mentioned, Barakalafikum, are more uh, versed or well-versed in their own dialects than the actual modern standard Arabic. Yeah. They need to add Arabic into their curriculum a bit more. The problem of Arabic, what kind of Arabic they add. Uh, the Arabic that you see in the books is Arabic, standard Arabic. Mm -hmm. However, when they speak, they speak something different. Yeah, and when they think, they think something different. Uh, yeah. So they don't. Uh, they almost. They can't express themselves in the same Arabic that they read. You're right. Yeah. And so, does that affect them in their creativity? Does it affect them in their writings? I, I would argue that it does. If you're thinking and expressing yourself in a language other than you write and read in, isn't that? It's stri difficult. It's difficult. Yeah. Of course, you're learning two languages at one time. It's almost like two different languages two at different one point. Languages. Yeah. yeah. But. Uh, on the positive side, you find a lot of positive things there. Mm -hmm. Yes, for example, language like Spanish language. Yes, six more than six hundred million people are speaking it. So, trying to establish some schools and some uh, organization that would take care of teaching Arabic to the people there mm -hmm. is something very important. You mean um, to the Muslims there, or just the general population? General population. Okay. If we if we are qualified, if we have enough qualified teachers to do the job. Why would Spanish but people want to learn Arabic? Uh, like an Arab who wants to study Spanish, because there is communication between now. Most of the people now need China, mm -hmm. right? Need Chinese. So if they need China because it produces for them a lot of the products yeah. now, so they need to learn Chinese. But I would argue that what they need of the Middle East differs from what they need from China. So they need from China, let's say, products in factories and so on, and so they need to be able to go there and communicate with the local population. Whereas foreigners who need something from the Arab world, at the level that they need, the people will accommodate them in English 99% of the time. Yeah. So I do, I do agree, but still, some people have different interests. Mm -hmm. And when these countries have some interests with Arab countries, right? They will start suggesting that Arabic would be, yes, perhaps a second or a third language in their countries. Mm -hmm. But are we ready? Are we ready with the teachers who do this? Mm -hmm. Are we ready with uh, programs on the internet or, and the TV that can teach easily others? I think we need to consider this as well. well I would argue that, alhamdulillah, it seems that there is a, um, a growing trend amongst Western Muslims, converts or otherwise, uh, to learn the Arabic language with the intention of understanding the Qur'an and the Sunnah better. And so this is a positive note, alhamdulillah. You alhamdulillah. see institutes and schools starting up in America and in the UK and so on, which are uh, accommodating the needs of the people. You're, you're right. So this is a nice positive uh, point, alhamdulillah. And I, I always, by the way, I hope some people would uh, hear me. I think we need to teach our children 
two important languages, Chinese, when they are young, or children when they are young. Mm -hmm. and they, you can consider which, this yourself. Which, which dialect? <laughs> the Arabic? No, no which saying? dialect of Chinese? Chinese? I don't know. <laughs> At least the Mandarin. Okay. Now, so uh, they need to learn Chinese. They need to learn Spanish because there's a lot of people behind that. Once we perfect, we have few people who perfect these languages, mm -hmm. they can uh, work uh, in the field of da'wah and they can serve these communities very well. At least we give them a message. I'm quite sure that many people will be affected by the message because the nature of Islam is something very beautiful from the practical viewpoint. As Definitely. you find that a lot of German women mm -hmm. uh, were converting to Islam because they found that it is, it is the religion that gives them the right. Mm -hmm. They did not find it. And gives them the right, right. With, with, with balance. The right of human beings for women. And a balanced right that's put into perspective you're, and that doesn't you're, ignore. You're absolutely right. Yes. Yeah. It's a very uh, honest, uh, it's, it's, it's the only honest religion. By them. Yes. Yeah. Anyway, with that, we're just about out of time. Uh, do you have any closing statements you'd like to make on the objectives and evaluations and how they go hand in hand? We're talking about the objectives of yeah. Dawa. And so the evaluation, you see, have now, you... Yeah. That's why you need to, we need to modify our methods, our yeah. approaches.